You may have noticed that we spin up all kinds of containers on my channel. They range from containers for media consumption, containers for creating content, containers for monitoring, containers for logging and metrics, containers for home automation, containers for custom code, and even containers for gaming. And while all these containers are really awesome and give us a ton of utility, I realized that I might have skipped over a very important and essential part of containers, and that's creating our own container. You might be asking, what is a container? A container is a standard unit of software that packages up code and all of its dependencies so that applications run quickly and reliably from one environment to another. That helps prevent the works on my machine symptoms you sometimes hear in software development. But it's even more than just working. A Docker container image is a lightweight, standalone, executable package of software that includes everything needed to run an application. Code, runtime, system tools, libraries, and settings. Think of it like software that has batteries included. And so once you bundle all of that up, it's called an image. And these images become containers when they run. And this image can be lifted and shifted to Windows, Mac, or Linux. And it will run the same regardless of infrastructure. And that's what makes images so powerful, not only during development, but also during runtime. So that aside, I mentioned we want to build our own Docker images. We're going to create an image that's a little more useful than the typical Hello World tutorials you see out there for Docker. It's going to be a tiny web server to serve out a web page through Nginx. We're going to make sure we can build it, run it, and test it on our own machine. And then we'll touch briefly on how we can automate this, making it repeatable on other machines. And we're going to do all of this in a couple of minutes. And after that, we'll have a custom Docker image that we can spin up and self-host in our own environment. So. It all starts out with a Docker file. Now, at first glance, this isn't anything special. If you look at it, it's just a file named Docker file, but that's really all it takes to start your first Docker image. In the first line, we're gonna type from. From specifies what base image we'll be using to build our own image. Almost every single image for Docker is based on another image, and most of them are Linux. You can specify an image like Ubuntu, and this will give you a good starting point with all the dependencies from Ubuntu to build your image. But if we're building a web server, we don't want to base it off of Ubuntu. We want to base it off something much, much smaller. And as I mentioned, we want to do that off of Nginx. So if we set Nginx, now our base image is from Nginx. And this is actually coming from Docker Hub. And in Docker Hub, you can see many different tags for this image. We have version tags, we have unversion tags, and then we have some that include some additional dependencies like Perl, or we have some that are based off an entirely different base image altogether, like Alpine. And we can pin this to any of the tags we just saw. So if we want to get the latest 1.10.1, this will give us the latest Nginx image. But this image, although small, is a little bit bigger than the Alpine one. I think the base Nginx image is around 50 megabytes, but we wanted this to be tiny. So we're actually gonna choose the Alpine version. And this is super tiny, it's like 19 megabytes. And if you're not familiar with Alpine Linux, it's a super tiny Linux distribution. I think it's only like five megabytes, so super tiny. And a lot of image maintainers base their images off of Alpine because it's so darn small. So we're gonna go with Alpine. Next up are environment variables, and they use the keyword env. You can see we get some IntelliSense here. And you can see it's just a key value pair. So if we wanted to set an environment variable of foo, equals bar, we could, or bar equals bats, we could do that too. Now we're not gonna use any environment variables. If we do need them, we'll pass them in when we create our container rather than specify them here. But if you're inheriting from an image that requires some variables to be passed in, you could do it here too, but we don't need them for this. So the next command we're gonna use and you see often is the copy command. And you can see the copy command takes two parameters. It takes a source and a destination. Now, what are we gonna copy? and where are we gonna copy it to? So the copy command can actually copy files from the host machine, so this machine that we're on, into our actual image. So for us, that means copying in our website or some static pages for this to serve up. So we haven't created those yet, so let's create them real quick. So first, let's create a source folder. And in this source folder, let's create a new folder called HTML. And in here, let's create an index.html. In this index.html, let's copy some HTML. <laughs> so this is a real simple web page. HTML tags, body tag, h1 tag saying hello, h1 tag again saying it works on my machine, and then a p or a paragraph saying, and it works on every machine. Then we close out the body, then we close out HTML. Let's format this, this, there we go. And then let's also add a couple of images, a wave and a whale. So let's include these in our web page. So IMG 
source equals wave. Close out. Copy this guy. Instead of wave, let's do whale. Okay, so now we should have a simple web page, but let's test it really quick. Okay, just did a file open on the index.html with the browser and it works. It's not winning any awards, but it does work. Please don't judge my web dev skills based on this page. I promise I can do a little bit better than this. And who knows, by the time you see this, I might update it and style it a little bit better. Oh, which is a good reminder. If you're looking for the documentation, you can find it in the description below. There should be a link in there to my documentation site, which also includes a link to all the source files for this repo and more. So as I was saying, maybe I'll style that a little bit more before you see this. Anyways. So now that we have our web page, we can go back to the Docker file because we were talking about the copy command. Little side quest there, creating a web page. But the copy command takes a source and a destination. So the source is all of src source.html and the destination. Where is the destination? So the destination is going to be slash user slash share slash nginx slash html. Now, how did I know that? Well, I've used Nginx a few times before. But this is where Nginx keeps its default site that it's gonna serve out. Notice I'm mentioning Nginx. So this is copying it inside of this image where Nginx lives in a location that's gonna serve out these files automatically. And a quick and easy way to do that is to copy it to here. Okay, so far, inherit from the base image Nginx that's based on Alpine. We're gonna copy in our web page or source files. And next, we're gonna expose some ports. Now, we don't really need to do this, but let me show you how this works. Now, we can actually expose a port of 80, and we can specify whether it's TCP or UDP. And if you don't specify at all, it's TCP. But really, we don't need to do this at all because when someone uses this image and they create a container from it, they can specify any port they want. So really, this is documentation telling the person who uses this which port they should use. And Nginx with a default configuration is set to use port 80. So this is documentation really, and really we can just comment it out. Next we'll need to define a command used for the entry point. And the keyword we use for that is CMD. You can see we're getting some hints here, so we should specify an executable. The executable is Nginx, but we also wanna pass some arguments to it. Now I know we need to pass a dash G and turn daemon off, but we don't pass it in like this. We actually need to pass in an array of parameters. So this looks kind of funny, but we would do it like this. So this is saying when this container starts up, run nginx, dash g, and daemon off. And if we wanted to run nginx in debug mode, we would run nginx dash debug with the same parameters, but we don't want to run it in debug mode. This is the same command that the nginx image passes in when it starts up by default. So you can leave this specified or we can remove it. And let's clean up some of our contents. So now we have a really, really simple image, but how do we build it? How do we spin it up? It's really simple, but first you need to make sure you have Docker installed and you can check by running Docker info. If you see this come back with some information and not an error, it means you have it installed. So to build our container, we need to make sure we're in the folder where our Docker file is. And if I cat it out, you can see the contents from Nginx, copy some files. We should be able to just run docker build dot. So this is saying docker engine, run build, and basically look for a docker file in the relative path, which is here, the current path. So if we run this command, we see it starting to build. We see it loading the Nginx image. So it's pulling the Nginx image down, extracting, building, and it looks like it's built. So to check this image that was just built, we should be able to run Docker images and see our image here. We can see we have an image ID, which is the one we just built, and it doesn't have a tag. If we wanted to build one with the tag, we would run docker build t, name your image, hello dash internet, and then a path to the Docker file, which is this current directory. So we've run this again. It'll build the container really quick. And if we run Docker images again, we can now see our tagged image. So the name is hello internet. The tag is latest image ID and about a minute ago. So great, we have an image, but we don't have a container yet. So how do we create a container? Remember, I said an image becomes a container when we actually execute it. So we execute it by running docker run dash d for a daemon dash p to expose some ports. 
and then the ports we want to expose. This is why I said when we're billing our image, it really doesn't matter if you expose those ports within the actual image because we're going to expose them here in our container. And then last, we actually need our image ID, which is right here. So this is saying Docker run as a daemon, expose port 80 on the inside to the port of 80 on the outside and use this image ID. So if we run that, we get this long ID back and our container should be running. But how do we know if it's running? Well, we should be able to run a Docker PS and see it running here. And we do. So we're seeing this container that has a name of Brave Carver and it's running, created 11 seconds ago and it's been up for 10 seconds. And you can see on my machine or all IPs, port 80 is mapped to 80 TCP. This is a good sign. So we should be able to go to localhost 8080 and see our web page. And here it is. That is awesome. So we have a Docker container running that was based on the image we created, which was based off of Nginx. We created some HTML and some images and put it inside of that container image. Now we've run it on port 8080 and we see it serving out our files. So this now will work on any machine that supports Docker or container D. As long as it's running a container engine, we could run this on Windows, Mac, or Linux and it'll execute and run just the same. So that's awesome. But how do we actually stop it now? You can see it's still running and it's gonna run indefinitely. So to stop it, we just run Docker stop and then the image name or ID finds Brave Carver and say stop. And that just stopped the container. So if we run Docker PS, we don't see it anymore, but it's actually there stopped. We didn't remove it. So if we run Docker PS dash A, we can see this container is here and it's exited and it was stopped two minutes ago. So if we wanna run this again, we don't need to create another image. We can just run docker start and this image name, Brave Carver, start it back up. And if we run docker ps, we see it's running. And if we refresh again, it's running again. So let's actually stop this. Let's actually remove this container. So this docker rm in the container name, that removes the container but if we look, we still see we have the image there. So if we run Docker images, that's still there. To remove an image, we just run Docker RMI and then the image name or ID. And now that deleted the image off of our machine. Another thing worth mentioning is a Docker ignore file. A Docker ignore file is a simple file that tells Docker to ignore files when it builds your container image, similar to a git ignore file. So if we create a new file and call it dot docker ignore, we get an icon meaning we created the right thing. And then we can specify files to ignore. Now in ignore files, you usually see some of the usual suspects, artifacts of builds or errors or things while you're debugging that you actually don't want to put inside of your container. But as you can see, we don't have any of these files here, so it really doesn't help us. But let's say for instance, in here, we had a password.txt file. And in here we had some secret password. So if we have this password file in here, I know this is a contrived example, but bear with me. If we have this password file inside of here and we run the Docker build, the Docker build is actually gonna copy everything from source slash HTML, which includes this password text and put it inside of our image. So that means that file will live inside of the image and anyone who spins this container up can actually see that file. Let's do that really quick. So let's build that image again really quick. And then let's run that image and turn it into a container. We see it's running. Now let's exec into this container and take a look around. So exec is a special command that you can do to actually execute inside of a container while it's running. So you can inspect things, debug things, or run things, or really do whatever you want. But we're gonna exec into this container and see our password file in there. So we're going to run a docker exec-it and then the ID of the image that's running right here, and then slash bin slash sh. So what this is saying is Docker exec in an interactive mode into this container that's running. And when you get there, execute slash bin slash sh. Now, sometimes you'll see people executing bash when they exec in, but Alpine doesn't have bash, so we have to execute this slash bin slash sh. And this pretty much works on most containers. And so if we execute, into here, now we see a terminal. So we're actually inside of this container. So where did we put our files? If we look in our Docker file, 
We set it's in slash user slash share slash nginx slash html. So cd slash user slash share slash nginx slash html. And if we list out, we can see our password.txt here. If we cat it out, we can see our secret password here. So like I said, not ideal and not optimal to include additional files within your image. So let's exit out of here. Let's stop this container. Let's actually remove this container and let's rebuild this with a docker ignore file with the password text file inside of there. And so let's add that password text to our docker ignore file. You might think we just add password.txt here and we're covered. We're actually not because docker ignore files are relative to the file that you want to ignore. So since this password.txt file is inside a source slash HTML, it won't get ignored. So we can fix that by simply adding star star slash. So this is the glob pattern basically saying, ignore a password.txt anywhere in the path as you add files to it. So that's a little trick I just picked up. Now let's build this container using this docker ignore file with the ignore for this password.txt file. So docker build dot, then we get our ID here. Then we wanna run this image with this ID, turning it into a container. Now we have the container ID. Then we wanna exec into that container ID again. And then we wanna change directory to where all of our files are. And if we do an LS, we see that we don't have a password.txt file. So I know this again is a contrived example and you would never include a password, you never know, inside of your image but it's really just an example of how to use a Docker ignore file because they're really powerful and they should be used. Otherwise, you can add a ton of bloat to your container without knowing it. And we want to keep these container images really small. And just because we built this image on top of Nginx, it doesn't have to be Nginx. It could be Python. It could be Go. It could be Node. Or it could even be .NET. Or it could even be something full featured like Plex. Really, there's no limit to where you start. So I hope that gives you an idea of just how easy and how powerful creating your own custom Docker images can be. We started out with nothing, created a Docker file, leaned into a base image, created a web page, built our own custom Docker container from that, and then created a container running on our very own machine, serving up a super not so fancy web page we built ourselves. And if you're interested in how to build these container images during CI, I'll add some examples to my repo that's in my documentation. And in the future, we'll be covering how to push these images to our very own self-hosted container registry. So be sure you're subscribed to see how that turns out. So what do you think about building your own Docker images? Was it as hard as you thought it was going to be? Let me know in the comments section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a ton of fun. <laughs> well, until it's not anymore. Traffic is it's kind of tough because it, it's a different paradigm uh, and it's a lot of YAML and it's a lot of, it's a series of tubes that you got to all connect. And then when they connect, you have uh, TLS and things work great. When they don't, it's a lot of hunting and pecking. So.